Welcome everyone to Kilmore Presbyterian. Uh, we know that uh, some are joining us here today in the building, but others are still at home and we do want to join in worship with you. And we trust that as we continue to worship together, we will know the blessing of God. We join in worship. We're encouraged by the psalmist to praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us lift our hearts in praise as the praise band leads us in the song, O my soul, arise and bless your maker. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we humble ourselves in your presence, for you are the Sovereign One. You reign over all things. The wonders of your creation, the magnificence of the heavens and the beauty of the earth give eloquent witness to your great power and might. The ordering of nature declares your love and faithfulness. We therefore worship and adore you. We acknowledge that our praise is inadequate to give you the worship due. Forgive us when we undervalue your grace by our ingratitude, when we underestimate your holiness by our offhand approach in our praise and prayer. Lord, you are indeed perfect in holiness and rich in mercy. It's only by being both that we have any hope in this life and the life to come. Fill our hearts and minds with your goodness and grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for reaching out to us through your beloved Son. Thank you for sending him into the world to fulfill your rescue plan. 
So Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, we worship you and we adore you. You are called the Prince of Peace. As we meet for worship, may we experience that peace. Calm that which troubles us and robs us of that blessed assurance that you alone are our salvation. Ashamed of our sin, we call out to you for your love and forgiveness. Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth divine, come educate our minds. Explode the myths to which we so often cling. Clear our vision to appreciate the majestic splendor of our God. Do your gracious yet powerful work among us today as we offer up our time of worship so that all the glory will go to our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray through Christ our Lord, and we join together in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to be reading from verse 12 through to the end of the chapter. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord? or instructed him as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor as animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless, and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. 
He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Over lockdown, our young people uh, in Jam, that is Jesus and me, and our young people in, in young people's Bible class, they've had their own time together each Sunday for a Zoom meeting. But that's not going to be happening during August, and so we will be having a children's talk each week. And so we'll speak now to the boys and girls. Boys and girls... There's an advert on TV. On it we see a man. He looks just like any other person. He's talking about the changes lockdown have made. But we usually see him wearing a wig, a fancy white shirt with a bow tie, waistcoat and a funny shaped coat, which we sometimes call tails. On the advert, they're hanging on the back of the door. Here he is dressed up. Can you remember what he says to his reflection? Hello, mate. I really missed you. We could say that we have really missed you, and I most certainly have. Thankfully, you have had your online Zoom time each Sunday. Getting back to the advert, do you remember what his reflection says back to him? Actually, he sings back to him, Go compare. In our reading a few moments ago, we hear Isaiah and then God himself saying, To whom will you compare me? As much as to say, go compare. He mentions about other gods, those made by humans, idols made of wood, stone or precious metals. But actually, they're not real gods. Isaiah asks some big questions and here's one of them. Who can measure the waters in the hollow of his hands? Or with the breadth of his hand, mark off the heavens? And he mentions many other things. But the answer each time will be God. So, go compare. And you will see that God alone is all-powerful, knows everything, and can do anything. But I want to change the slogan from go compare, to go and share. A few verses back in the chapter, Isaiah talks about people sharing the good news about God. He tells them not to be afraid to talk about God and to help other people come to believe in God. He tells them that God is like a shepherd who wants to care for his people if they but trust in him. I wonder, will you go and share that there is no God like our God. He is great. He is powerful. He is wonderful. And he loves us. And he wants us to be his children and others to come to know him. Our next song tells us to go and share with others the story of God's love in Jesus. The song is, God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, I come to you. 
This photograph was taken last summer in an area of the Canadian Rockies where there had been a massive forest fire a few years before. Looking at the photo, one would think that the tree had been turned upside down and a lot of branches had broken off and were lying at the base. But I wonder, can you work out what this picture has captured? Well, it is a nest on the top of a pine tree. Again, could anyone hazard a guess to whom it belongs? It's an eagle's nest, a bald eagle to be precise. This eagle is an impressive bird. The adult male is about 90 centimetres or 3 foot long and has a wingspan of 2 metres, that's 6.6 .6 feet. Females which grow somewhat larger than males may reach 108 centimetres, that's 43 inches in length and have a wingspan of 2.5 metres or 8 feet. Both sexes are dark brown with a white head and tail. Quite a bird to behold. In the Bible, the eagle is used to portray strength, power, protection, vision and even destruction. Saul and Jonathan, for example, were described as being swifter than eagles in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 23. We are told to cast but glances at riches, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So says Proverbs 23, verse 5. More often than enough, the swooping down of the bird is likened to the descent of judgment upon the people. In Jeremiah 48, verse 40, for example, it says, Look, the eagle is swooping down, spreading its wings over Moab. A few verses later, it says, Moab will be destroyed as a nation because she defied the Lord. Or Hosea saying to the people in chapter 8, verse 1, An eagle is over the house of the Lord because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. The practice of the eagle nesting high up is used to warn folk that they cannot escape God. Though you build your nest as high as the eagles, from there I will bring you down, so claims Jeremiah in chapter 49 verse 16. Similarly, in Obadiah 1 verse 4, we read, Though you soar like the eagle, and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down. Maybe that could apply to some groups within the community who by their reckless behaviour think the coronavirus will not affect them. But it's not on the judgment aspect that I want to major this morning. That may be for another time. Rather, I want to look at the power and protection metaphors. There are three references I want to ponder on briefly with you. One of them is found in the passage read earlier, Isaiah 40, verse 31. The other two are in Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, and Revelation 12, verse 14. I want to relate them to the life of the church and the individual believer. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. There we read, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its pinions. The previous verse is talking about God's care for his people. We read, He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. This is the first part of the Song of Moses, where he is relating God's power and protection and displaying his mighty hand and faithful love. And here he talks about the parenting skills of the eagle as an illustration. Why does the eagle stir up the nest? Well, at the appointed time, the chicks need to learn to fly. They've got used to the security of the nest. They've been well fed by the parents. But that's not where they are meant to stay. They're meant to be out of the nest, flying around. They need that nudge, as it were to get out there on the air currents, soaring and searching. The young have to be disturbed. Some commentators see this stirring as the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. 
It's the conviction of sin. When someone is stirred from complacency in life, those who are ignoring God and the things of God, they're convicted of their sinful state. They're prompted to seek the Lord for salvation. This is indeed the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe that with all my heart. Yet I wonder, is this metaphor more to do with the believer or believers? It is referring in this context to the children of Israel. They had been in the wilderness. God wanted them to move on into the promised land. Yet they had been dilatory to do so. They showed reticence in trusting the Lord as if he would not keep his promise. It's so easy for those who are Christians to become at ease where they are. For example, they're part of a loving and close-knit church family. There they feel secure. They are happy and life is, for the most part, going well within that bubble. But is that how we are meant to live as believers? Ought we not to be out there? Maybe this current pandemic has been the strong nudge to consider how we can reach out. We have been forced, as it were, to be innovative in our approach to worship and communicating the gospel. It has been a steep learning curve for many. To me, this verse is a great comfort. Like the eagle being the wise parent, shunting the chicks out, it knows how to care for and train them. Look at the wonderful depiction. The parent hovering over and spreading its wings to catch them and carrying them on its pinions. How wonderful. God does not push us out of the nest, as it were, and leave us to our own devices. We may be pushed, but protected. We can surely say thank you, Lord, for that. Let us move over to Isaiah 40, verse 31. It reads, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's get the context. We hear the people complaining that they felt God had abandoned them. How could they? As we were saying to the children, Isaiah had told the people, Go compare. There was none like the Lord. How can they whinge? He neither gets tired or weary. He's being all powerful. He is the source of strength and endurance. Yes, we all get tired at times. Even the young ones whose energy seems endless. Indeed, we may stumble and fall. I think of children running down a grassy slope. The speed overcomes them and they take a tumble. All this taken into the spiritual realm happens so easily. It can be seen after a busy church calendar, the winter's work, all the activity, the meetings, the programs, the hours spent in the organisations, and the list goes on. Or sadly, the pressures of fellowship, or to be more accurate, lack of. Possible breakdown of relationships, or what could simply be called the attack of Satan? Whatever the cause, we can find ourselves tired and weary. The answer is twofold. Jesus told his disciples to come away for a time. We do need that downtime. But that is not a turn off time. It ought to be an opportunity to recharge the battery. And that means spending quality time with the Lord. That's what it means to hope in the Lord. Our hope is confirmed as we meditate on the greatness and the grace of the Lord. When we do that, the promise of this verse comes into play. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And then we have the thrilling picture of the eagle soaring on a thermal. We too can do the same spiritually. So when our spiritual fervour is flagging, and we feel we are burnt out, let us turn and take hope from the soaring eagle. Our last verse is Revelation 12, verse 14. Here we find these words. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, 
where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. This verse is in the chapter entitled in the NIV, The Woman and the Dragon. In verses 13 to 17, it depicts the war between Satan and the woman and her son. This, in essence, is speaking of the persistent hostility between Satan and the people of God. Satan, having been defeated in heaven and being confined to earth, hits out against those associated with his conqueror. Thus we discover the persecution of the church. It is instigated by Satan and he uses all his powers, insidious schemes and underhand methods to try to destroy the church. Sadly, we see it so often with a lot of damage. Frequently not caused by outsiders, but by those within who claim to be members. How does John in his vision see this being dealt with? In verse 14, we have the depiction of the flight of the great eagle being easily able to carry the woman away to safety. My quirky mind turns to the advert of an energy drink with the slogan, Gives you wings. Here it probably indicates the ease and flight, speed of flight. One commentator sees a reminder of the exodus from Egypt of the people of God into the wilderness. He relates it to the church in that members of the church live in the world, the great city, but they do not belong to it. Though they dwell physically in cities, their true home and their sure refuge is far from the great city, i.e. in the wilderness. The metaphor of the eagle's wings in this context can be found in Exodus 19 verse 4, where we read, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. For the church, we can take comfort from this in that even though we may experience persecution in many and varied forms, ultimately Satan has been conquered and we have the knowledge that we too will overcome and will dwell with the Lord forever. So what can we take from our brief look at aspects of the eagle as seen in scripture? I see that the challenges we face can be God nudging us into the place where he wants us to be, with the assurance that he is alongside us, watching over us, like the parent eagle, as we sometimes take tentative steps in service for him. Remember, he is with us. Secondly, the channel of blessing that comes from hoping in the Lord. When we fall, get tired or weary in our Christian lives, we have the promise of being lifted up, strengthened, and beyond our imagining, even soaring like the eagles. Remember, he will help us. Lastly, the changeless nature of God's purpose for his church. Despite all the pressures and persecution brought upon the church of Christ, as the Lord himself said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Remember, he will protect us. Amen. As we come to God in prayer, we bring to God situations in our own and other lands where people need to know and experience the truths we have been discovering. So let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we bow before you, recognizing that you are one with whom there is no comparison. You are the great God, the merciful God. You are the loving and faithful God. And we thank you that you do watch over us. You nudge us at times to walk in your ways and to fulfill your purpose. We pray, Lord, that we indeed will do that. That we will be prompted to share, to go and to help other people come to know you the great God, the God who brings salvation. Help us to be witnesses, O God, to what you have done, what you've done in our lives and what you can do in theirs. 
We pray for those, O oh God, who have gone to other lands to share that good news. We pray that you'll be with them and that you will strengthen them. May they be bold for you in their witness. And may they declare the greatness of God. We pray for those who are persecuted because they are witnessing for you. Even though their lives are showing the love of God and they are speaking the truth of God, there are those who do not want it and want to silence them. Lord, grant them courage at this time. Surround them with your love and uphold them as on eagles' wings. We come, O oh God, to pray for those who are in need, those who are tired and weary, those who are suffering at this time, suffering mentally or physically. We pray for those who are still recovering from the effects of COVID-19, those who are struggling to get back to health and strength. We pray that you will strengthen them at this time. We pray too for those who have been caring for them. We thank you for the NHS staff and we thank you for all the knowledge and skills and the love that they show. We pray that you will help them to bring healing to others. Father, we pray for wisdom in this our day and generation. And we pray particularly for young folk. We pray for those who are struggling with the easing of lockdown, but do not know how to treat it well. We pray, Lord, that they will see that their actions can affect others. And we pray, Lord, that they will see that they need to protect others. We pray, Lord, that they will not get the opinion that nothing can touch them. We pray that they will live sensibly. Lord, we pray for our governments as they try to make that path through all this difficulty. Give them wisdom. Give them common sense. And we pray, Lord, that the decisions they make will be for the good of the people. We recognise that our land is going to be in great debt. We pray, Lord, for the Chancellor and all those in the Treasury and those who have to make decisions about money and how to spend it and where they're going to get it from. We pray that they will use the money that they have wisely. We pray for those who are struggling financially, those who have businesses that are really going under because they do not have the finance. We pray, Lord, that there will be a way through this. Lord, we pray that you will be in our community. We pray for your protection. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, those who need your comfort. And Lord, as we do come out of lockdown, we, we pray for our church communities and church families, uh, those who are gathering again for worship and those who are waiting and making pro uh, some sort of progress in coming together. Lord, again we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, we now pray for one another, those who need you now in a particular way. We mention them by name before you. Lord, hear these and all our prayers. For we come in the name of Jesus Christ, both Saviour and Lord. Amen. Our final song is taking up that theme of the eagle. And the chorus is on eagle's wings. Oh, my God. 
In these trying times of uncertainty, may we know the peace of God which passes all understanding to keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us go in the strength of God to serve and glorify him day by day. And so we bless one another in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.